Thanks for joining us here at Christ Church, where we are one church meeting in multiple locations and reaching around the world thanks to what God is doing through church online. If you have any questions or want to learn more about us as a church, you can always check us out by simply going to ChristChurch.LA. We would love for you to stay connected throughout your week and everywhere you go through our Christ Church app. It's free and available wherever you download apps from. With all that being said, let's get into the service. Well, good morning again. Thank you for your worship. Thank you for who you are as a people. God bless you. Thank you for your presence here today. I just want to look right in the camera. And I want you to help me welcome our Rustin family right now. Come on, let's give it up for Pastor Jeremy and Dana. Come on, give it up. Everybody viewing online from wherever you are around the world, we want to welcome you. We've been praying for you, believing God's going to do great things in your life. If you have your Bibles, John chapter 3 and John chapter 8, uh, we're going to be in the book of John, the gospel of John today. So if you'll look at those, turn to those passages. And while you're doing that, um, let me just remind you that after every service, Ruston and West Monroe campuses, we're having baptismal service. And some of you in the room today, you, maybe you've made a uh, start with Christ. You've publicly declared Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you've never gotten around to being baptized for whatever reason. I just want to remind you today that um, baptism is not an option. It's a command. It's the command of Scripture. As a matter of fact, Jesus went to the River Jordan where John was baptizing, and, and he said to John, I want you to baptize me. But John protested, Lord, I mean, you need to baptize me. I don't need to baptize you. But Jesus said, allow it to happen that I may fulfill all righteousness. I want to tell you, if, if baptism was good with Jesus, baptism is good with me. Can you say amen to that? So it's not some kind of if I want to kind of deal. The scripture commands us. They commanded them after they professed Christ and believed the word, heard the word and believed they, were com they commanded them to be baptized. So I want to tell you today, we have taken all the guesswork out of it for you. Uh, maybe you've thought, well, I'll do it sometime, but I just never got around to it. Uh, we've got everything prepared for you at both campuses. We have everything prepared. You didn't come with a towel. You didn't come with something to be baptized in. It's all there. Every size from petite to triple X out there. Underclothes, shorts, t-shirts, hair dryers, flip-flops, everything you need to just to say yes to obedience to Jesus Christ. So I just challenge you with that at the outset. We've been praying that you would take the next step in your faith. And so if that's you today, I challenge you to do that. Last week, Gil Martin did a phenomenal job with part one of our series, Marked. He taught us that we're marked by the way that we think and uh, that we have the mind of Christ. I want to I think like Christ. I want to be marked by the thoughts that Christ puts in my life. And uh, so I know that you were blessed. If you didn't hear that, if you weren't here, go to ChristChurch.LA uh, and listen to that message. If you, or you can go to the app or however you want to get it. Social media, it's out there in numerous ways. It will change your life. So everybody say amen. amen. Norman Vincent Peale was walking through the streets of Kowloon, Hong Kong and came upon a tattoo parlor. Normally would not have, he wasn't a tattoo guy, and so he normally would not have lingered, but something caught his eye. It was back in the day, so there were four or five options that somebody could have tattooed on their arm or their chest or whatever, ankle maybe. Um, and one was like an anchor, like the, the sailor men, you know, in the, in, in the day of World War II, or there was a, a heart with an arrow through it and uh, I love mom kind of deal on the shoulder or an eagle or an eagle with a flag, you know, in his mouth, a U.S. flag. Or, and then there was one thing, one tattoo that was available that you could get, and it caught his eye. And he, he, he just stopped in his tracks to analyze this. And it, it, was, it was three words, simply this, born to lose. Born to lose. He thought, am I reading this right? I mean, would somebody actually put that indelibly on their skin forever, born to lose. So he went in the tattoo shop to talk to the tattoo artist and get a little perspective. And, and he's talking to this man who had broken English. And he said, I just need to know, does anybody ever come in here and get the words born to lose tattooed on their body? And the guy said and nodded, yes, they do. And Norman Vincent Peale said, I just, 
Can't believe that anybody would do that. It's beyond me. It, 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 it escapes me why somebody would do that to their body. And the man in broken English simply said, before tattoo on body, tattoo on mind. Wow. Some of you get that after a while, I guess. Before it's tattooed on their body, they've already thought it in their mind. My goodness. God help us to live as people who have the mind of Christ. I want to talk to you about how the, the enemy wants to label you, but that God has already marked you out for his own. John chapter 8, the third verse, it's a familiar uh, passage of scripture that, that I preach from often, that you've heard of often. Both passages that we'll look today are very familiar to us. Let me begin reading in verse number 3, John 8, chapter 3. It's about the woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to Jesus a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. Look, they, they clarified it so they don't leave any, um, anything to your imagination. She was caught in the very act of adultery. Lord, it was going on and we dragged her out of there. Caught in the very act of adultery. Verse 5, now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? They said this, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to him, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Some have supposed that he wrote some of their sins in the dirt. Some have said he wrote something out of Moses' law. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their, their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Now, remember, here, here's a group of people with stones in their hand. We'll go to Israel in, in November, and you'll, you, if you go, you'll find out why in Middle Eastern arenas, they throw rocks at each other a lot. Because everywhere you look, there are rocks on the ground. All you have to do is stoop over, and you're, you're, you're no longer further than 18 inches from a rock in most places. And, and so when Jesus had, had raised himself up, saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I wonder what kind of labels people were hanging on that woman after that incident. I mean, really, I mean, we, we would label her. We would say things like slutty, trashy, adulterous. We would hang the scarlet A around her neck. We would, we would walk in, in that moment in, in judgment of her very likely feel adulterous. You, you know, we like to label people, don't you? Sometimes, sometimes in the normal course of conversation, uh, we, we mutter labels like, well, that's pretty low class. Uh, you know, that's ignorant. What a, what a loser. Don't raise your hand. But I know you've said those kinds of things before. Sometimes we hang labels on other people. Sometimes we label ourselves and sometimes we inadvertently get labeled. I was a kid, tried out for eighth grade basketball. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was raised in a pretty strict religious environment. You guys know that. It was almost like breathing clean air is a sin. I mean, we just, <laughs> whew. So I want to, I want to go try out for eighth grade basketball, but I never wore, wore a pair of shorts in my life. And so my mama cut some jeans off for me. We often joke, I'd love to go swimming with you, but I got a hole in the knee in my swimsuit, you know. I said, that's about how these shorts were. <laughs> Way down there. You want to make sure we were modest. So I believe in modesty. Anybody else believe in modesty? It's about summertime. Come on, let's be modest people. Let's don't be legalistic, but let's be modest, right? So, I mean, we, I, I was modest that day. 
I went out and tried for basketball, eighth grade basketball. I couldn't walk and chew bubble gum at the same time, much less dribble and do a layup. And so I, I didn't get, make the cut. And, and I, I thought at least partly it's because they didn't want my lily white legs blinding everybody in the gym. And the guys trying to shoot the basket couldn't see the basket because my legs were giving off so much light. Um, so I, I lived through that and I didn't make the cut. So I decided to go out for track. Um, and I'll tell you, those shorts at a track a tryout, they look pretty funny. I went out for track, but too slow low, didn't get a uniform. I didn't make the cut. Um, and so pretty quickly after that, tried out for several different sports, never made the team. I, I gave myself this self-imposed label, not very athletic. Not very athletic, because I wasn't. Somebody recently said, hey, why don't we get a, 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 a maturing men's basketball team. Uh, and I said, I'll, I'll cheer y'all on from the sidelines. Trust me. <laughs> on top of that, I had a real problem with my skin in junior high. Who doesn't? Most people do. And no matter how I tried, man, I just, uh, about at the most inopportune time, I would have a breakout. I remember one time I had a bump right here. I missed three days of school because <laughs> it looked like I was trying to grow another nose, people. I promise you. <laughs> That sucker was out there. It was terrible, terrible, terrible. So I, I got this other self-imposed label. I did it to myself. Not very attractive. Then one day I got in a fight at the bus stop, and I got my rear end handed to me at the bus stop, and I got another label, not very tough. By the 10th grade, I totally flunked geometry in French, brought home three Fs. I'm not advising that because I got my rear end handed to me one more time <laughs> by my daddy uh, and gave myself another label, not very smart. I'm going to ask you a question. I think everybody in the room has enough mental acuity to be able to answer. Look, you look like bright people. You can get this answer. It's not very hard, but I'm going to ask you the question. I'm just going to ask you not to say it verbally, the answer, but just to think it and to answer it, not to speak it in your mind. The answer to this question has potential to shape your entire future. If you get this question right, it has the potential to steer you in the right path and to lead you along a course where your life is filled with quality and blessing and goodness. Not just in Jay High, not just in high school, not just in, at the university or in technical school or in the corporate world. Your entire life can be affected if you understand this concept. So I'm going to ask you the question, but instead of you shouting back at me, I just want you to think about it and uh, just uh, answer the question in your mind. Are you ready? Who has the right to label you? I'm talking to people here today who are being pursued by the love of Jesus Christ, and he has already marked you out as his own prized possession. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. We are a, a, a kingdom of priests. We are his own special prized possession, 1 Peter 2 and 9. Listen, who has the right to label you? Because we've all got labels, and some labels we gave ourselves, some of them other people hung on us, but this is what I want to tell you. If you're taking notes, I wish you were, write it down. God's opinion of us is not based on what we or other people think. I want you to process before I say the rest of that. I don't care how many labels I give myself, God doesn't see me that same way. I don't care who labels me what, God's opinion is not based on what we think of ourselves or what somebody else may think of us. He sees us from his own unique perspective. Are you glad about that today? I mean, really, aren't you thankful that the Lord sees you not, not through human eyes, but through the eyes of heaven? Let me make it, uh, just tell you that because sin is the thing we all know something about. We know about it because we were born with this tendencies ingrained in our nature. The literal meaning of the word, the best definition of the word, according to Thayer's lexicon, New Testament lexicon, is to miss the mark, to sin, to miss the mark, to come up short. Whoever misses the mark of God's best for their life, our words, our attitude, our motives, our action, anything that's off the mark of God's best and highest ideals for our lives 
becomes sin to us. Sin is not just a violation of the Ten Commandments. Sin is not something that can be ranked as big or small. Sin is sin. Missing the mark is missing the mark. There are no big sins. There are no little sins. You know how it is. In our minds, we, well, I, all my sins are little, but th- theirs are like, like big sins comparatively. I remember as a child, we had way back in the day, and some of you heard this, and I'll always tell it till the day I die because it, it doesn't maybe not be comfortable to anybody else, but it's just hilarious to me because I was there. Back in the day, right behind me where the children's ministry sits, there was just a white church seated about 125 people. You walk in the front door, there's a very small vestibule, and then you walk through these swinging doors, and there's a center aisle, two bays of seats, pews, and then an outer aisle by the wall. Some of you were in that building. My grandpa sat on the fifth row at the center aisle. My grandma sat on the second row by the wall over there. And we, back in the day, we had testimony service, right? You, you, you stand up and give your testimony, and somebody would be uh, conducting the service. They'd stand behind the pulpit and, and say, well, we're going to have testimony service. You, got, you want to give glory to God? We'll, we'll let you give glory to God. So my grandpa loved that because that was his opportunity to speak in church, right? And so he would stand up on the fifth row of the center aisle, and he was, one time he said something like this to my dad while he was leading the service. He said, Brother Lowe, when I came into this thing, it was just like popcorn, people popping up, popping up. Now it's done turned into something like a barber shop. You got to stand up there and keep saying, all right, now who's going to be next? Urging people to testify, all right? So this one Sunday morning, I'll never forget it as long as I live, my grandpa stood up to testify, and I told you we were raised rigid. TV was like a damnable sin. I don't know. It's pretty close to that right now. I think probably most of you agree, right? I mean, it's just not much on there, but we didn't have television, but my grandpa had one and he was going to justify himself before the church. So he stands up to testify, uses this opportunity to, to clear himself. And he says, now, Brother Lowe, you know, I watched that international news, but, but now you take the wife over. Now she'll watch that old gun smoke. <laughs> My, my dad trying to build a church, largely family, and grandma's over here on the second pew after he says that. Oh, shut up, you stupid idiot. Shut up. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's funny. I don't care what you say. I mean, dear mercy, help us, God. Now, see, we all got our order of classification. Little white lies somewhere down here, the horrible, ugly, more hideous transgressions way up there. But in the mind of God, it's all disobedience. We agree with that. I think we all do. There's no big sins, no little sins. And sin is not without its consequence. Shame is a part of the cycle of sin. Shame is why Adam and Eve would hide from God in the garden after they had transgressed the command of the Lord and eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Shame is why many people don't go to church. Shame is why people sometimes don't pray or worship. Somehow this computer sitting on top of our neck programs to us and does a calculation. Oh, God's got me labeled. And if I start to talk to God, he'll remember I'm here and he'll go, oh yeah, you. Now I've been wanting to talk to you. Let's have a conversation. Somehow the human mind calculates that if we stay away from God, or if we don't go to small group, or we don't raise our hands too high in worship, or if we just stay away from worship completely, then maybe God won't remember. But if I go if I really get involved in worship and raise my hands, then maybe I'm going to draw God's attention and ultimately God's wrath for my sin. I love John 3, 16. You could quote it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isn't that an amazing verse? But look at the second verse that follows it. Sometimes we don't follow up. I think we ought to make it like two verses into one, right? But the, the scripture goes on to say, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through the world through him might be saved. I want to tell you today, if you're worried, God's not looking to knock you into the middle of next week. You miss the mark, he loves you. You come up short, God's heart breaks for you. You mired in some sinful thing, some secret sin, something that's going to destroy you. If you don't get it right, the heart of God breaks 
for you. He's not looking like down from heaven with a big hammer waiting just to, like a bug and just to stamp the life out. That's not the heart of God. Please understand, religion may have taught you that, but the love of Jesus is found in this book. And all through this book, the heart of God pursues those who are broken by sin. Broken by sin. God's for you. He's not against you. It's exactly what Jesus did for the woman in John 8 who was caught in her sinful condition. Again, John 8 and 10, he said to her, woman, where are those your accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And so this story from John chapter 8 gives us some valuable insight, I believe, about God's opinion of us. And because they wanted to plaster labels all over her, they asked Jesus a question. What do you say about this incident, about this woman and about her sin? I want you to know that what God thinks about our sin. I want you to know that God hates sin. God hates sin, and we ought to hate sin. But because God hates sin does not equate with what some people think that God hates the sinner. He hates the sin. He has love and compassion for the sinner. There are people who could take this book and slice and dice people to a a bunch of little giblets and leave them beaten and bleeding as they walk out of the doors of the church. That's not the heart of Christ. That is not the heart of this church. Listen, we want you to know that there's a righteous God that one day we'll give an account for all the things that we've done in our body. But right now we have a window of grace that the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross. We celebrated that just a moment ago. He paid your sin debt. He gives you free access to the throne of God. If only you'll turn from your sin and to Jesus. We want you to come in broken. We want you to walk out of here with a skip in your step and know it that your sins have been made white as snow. We want to to give life. That's what Jesus does, gives life. You got to understand that day, all these people wanting to tag a bunch of labels, but God sees us from a different vantage point than our peers and the rest of the world around us. This woman that day had her reputation affected. Her relationship with the community and the crowd was damaged. And that's Certainly part of the consequences of poor decisions, bad behavior, rebellion against God, and sin. I'm not here to tell you that it's all going to go away automatically if you get your life right with God. Sin has its consequences. But I can tell you this. That's not the viewpoint that God takes. He's not looking. There's going to come a day of recompense. There's going to come a day when sin is judged. It was already judged at Calvary, and then we'll give an account one day. But today is not the day. We are under the blood of Jesus Christ if, in fact, we'll turn to him in faith and believe and trust him. He doesn't form his opinion like people do. He he has a completely different, he's got a heavenly mental mapping system if there's such a thing. God doesn't see you as people see you. That doesn't mean that you won't have to deal with the effects of your sin or your actions that have on other people, but it does mean that God doesn't join in with the put-downs. He doesn't pick up the stones and take a hard stance against you. He doesn't gather a few perfect people as if there were some. And gather around you in your moment of failure and beat the life out of you. No, that's not God. When we fail, his heart breaks. When we miss the mark, when we sin, he rushes to our aid to protect us, to peel away the harsh labels that people want to affix to our life, and he gently restores us. Again, look at John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Contrary to popular opinion, God's not looking for people to condemn. God's the one who says, work with me here. I've got some principles for living that if you'll just slow down and listen and embrace my words, learn to live by them, you're going to have a whole lot better experience here. I can give you a little heaven on earth if you'll work with me, if you'll listen to me and obey what I tell you to do. That's God's perspective. Our human perspective is always downward, tainted by sin. What did Gil Martin say last week that we have ants in our brains? What was that? Anybody remember that? Ants in our brains? automatic negative thoughts got to answer in our brains but we're supposed to have the mind of Christ God's 
perspective is different from our human perspective. This always seems to be downward, tainted by sin, marred by shame. So we're always looking for an opportunity to place blame on others, to fix labels on other people and to ourselves. But God's perspective is a complete reversal of the damage that sin does. The gospel is the good news about Jesus. He sees us through the blood of Calvary. He's not into labeling people who are already reeling from a horrible mistake or broken by life or broken by sin. Jesus brings enough grace to meet the mistake. So I want to set you free today. You made some horrible decisions. There's enough blood of Calvary. If you'll reach out to Jesus, he'll cover you, cleanse you, heal you, set you aright, and give you a new lease and new hope. Here's the third thing. God doesn't condemn us. He wants to clear our conscience. Isn't it great how Jesus said to the lady that day, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. It's, it's as if he were saying, I don't want you to walk away from here troubled. I don't want this sin to wreck your entire life. I don't want you to live in a constant state of condemnation. I don't want you to leave here with the thought that your future just ended. I want you to be at ease. I want to take your heavy burden, your yoke, lay it at my feet and take the easy to be carried burden that I have for you. I want you to know that all those who would have condemned you just came face to face with their own sin and neither do I condemn you. So how about go away from here? And let me take the pressure off. You walk away from this horrible experience with the ease of forgiveness in your heart and with that burden off your mind so that you can go forward with your life knowing the Savior that stands before you. Listen to me, what Jesus would have said to her is what I'm saying to you right now. Your past is not your future. Your past is not your future. Why don't you take the labels off? Why don't you quit painting yourself in some corner? Why don't you quit looking in the mirror and saying how sorry you are or how worthless you are or how undeserving of God's love you are. Your past is not your future. It's not. Move on to a better, brighter tomorrow in the forgiveness and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I don't condemn you. When are you going to quit condemning yourself? I'm not here to be ruthless and harsh. You're a cake half baked. I'm not finished with you yet. Let's get on with it today. How long are you going to let that pull you down? How long are you going to let that thing for which you've already been forgiven? I'm speaking to somebody in this room today. How long are you going to wait and allow that thing for which you've already been forgiven to haunt you and to rob you of sleep and to hold you like a captive in a prison? How long? I want to tell you something. I think believers don't have that big of a deal believing and trusting the blood of Jesus to forgive us. I think our biggest struggle, at least in my own life, is when I'm brushing my teeth in the morning and washing my face and look at that man in the mirror and I am self-condemning. We struggle getting over our own selves. It's an affront, really, to the blood of Jesus. I mean, it's an arrogant stance if you want to know the truth about it, to say, well, I, I know Jesus forgave me, but I, I can't forgive myself. Listen, I want to tell you, if Jesus can forgive you, you ought to be able to forgive yourself. The whole idea is really simple. Again, people have a hard time receiving the simplicity of it because we want to be harder on ourselves than God is. And we have to, that innate thing that is so self-condemning, but here's the key, sincerely, sincerely. Listen, if you're involved in some sin today that's dogging your path, that you've had a struggle releasing, maybe you're involved in some hidden sin. Nobody but you and God knows. I want to tell you, remind you, God does know, by the way. You, know, hide, you, might be, you hide it from me, you hide it from somebody else you love, your coworkers, your spouse, your family. You're not hiding it from God. Why don't you turn from it? Give it to God. Lay it down. Sincerely ask God to forgive you. Turn from your sin and then uh, get that monkey off your back. Strive to do your best to honor God with your life. Live in a constant, really, a constant state of repentance. Anybody else have to repent often? Man, I do. Yeah, about every other 30 minutes. Right? Here's the last thing. God never abandons us. He stays in relationship with us. 
may come as a surprise to some of you because a lot of people just assume that when we do wrong, when we sin, when we fail, God missed the mark. Most people assume that God just sort of vanishes out of our lives. He keeps himself at a distance from the filthy sinner. That's a misnomer. That's a, a misunderstanding, a false assumption that we've concocted about God. The scriptures present us with a God who is pursuing us at all costs. He's pursuing us at all costs. Some of Trina's extended family, especially some of her second, third cousins, and one particular uncle was just an outlaw. He, some of them have gone on to, to be with the Lord, but they all from Saul Parish. Um, and uh, they just, they thought that the Wildlife and Fisheries Handbook was like a joke book or something, you know? They just didn't think it applied to them. And so they killed more deer than they're supposed to kill. They caught more fish, more fish than they're supposed to catch. They shot more ducks than they're supposed to shoot. I mean, it's just how they live their lives. One particularly funny story, her, her uncle, who was fairly rotund, uh, just shot the ducks. Man, he emptied his, his, his pouch with shells. He had about three boxes of shells. He had more, he had ducks, more ducks he could, could carry. He's hiding some in the, in the weeds out there and the laws after him, the game wardens. They, they all run from the game warden their whole life. They just grew up running from the game warden. He's running from the gate. They live down there on the river, old river, and there's no levee. And so the house, to keep it from flooding, when the river got up, they'd build it up a little bit. And he came running from the game warden as fast as he could. He's out of breath. He just falls in the front door into the living room floor. And he said, I'm caught, and I'm caught bad. I'm caught, and I'm caught bad. I want to tell you, I'm sure that's how this lady felt in that moment. Certainly, it must have felt that way to her. But the reality is... As they pulled her from the bed and she just grabbed a sheet or a towel or a gown or something to cover her nakedness, they throw her in the city square. She's doing her best to cover her nakedness. Her bloodthirsty accusers gathered around her to stone her to death. But Jesus didn't see how much distance he could put between this, himself and this woman, her vile sin and his purity. Sin, again, make no mistakes, carries consequences. It will jack your life up. But I don't care how jacked up you get. Jesus is still for you. You might have family turn their back on you. You might have friends that you thought were lifelong friends that could never, ever in a million years imagine they will walk away from you. When you face plant in your cesspool of sin and nobody's around to help you up, open your eyes, Jesus. We'll be standing there for you. Jesus will be there for you. Friends and family may turn on you. Jesus never will. Here's my challenge to you today. If your heart belongs to Jesus Christ and you do the things we're talking about, if you'll honestly turn to him, humble yourself, repent of your sin, he will pick you up and give you a fresh start every time. It's not, listen, it's not about whether or not we deserve it. It's not about whether or not you deserve it. It's, it's about whether or not you will believe it and receive it. Amen. He holds the gift out and says, I've got you covered. All you need to know at that moment is all the labels come off. Condemnation vanishes. You're washed. You're cleansed by the blood of Calvary. You've made, been made clean by the blood of Jesus. Psalm 32. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete, doesn't that sound wonderful? Whose lives are lived in complete honesty. Got no dark corners in your life, no hidden compartments, not trying to skirt the issue, not, not trying to hide something. You can just be open and honest. You don't have to try to remember what lie did I tell last week. Whose lives are living in complete honesty. Yet when I refuse to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you. Stop trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I'll confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is. Say it with me. All my guilt is gone. Say it again. All my guilt is. All my guilt is, all my guilt is gone. I have been marked out for the righteousness of God in Christ. I am hidden in him. He has called me his own. I am a son. I am a daughter of the king. Amen.
final, period. No comma, but I am a child of God. Come on, would you help me celebrate the Word of God today? Hope you've been encouraged by the message today. We know that the Word of God is alive and that Jesus is ministering to you right where you are right now. You see, he sent his Holy Spirit to move us, to comfort us, and to challenge us to love God with all of our hearts, to be loved on by God, and to love the world as we love ourselves. So today I ask you, wherever you are watching from, why don't you close your eyes and bow your head? You see, maybe you're viewing online today and you've never placed your trust in Jesus' Lordship. You see, he's coming for you. He wants you and he wants for you to know this free gift of salvation. And so the scripture teaches us that if we would confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, if we would believe in our hearts that the Father raised him from the dead, that we enter into this salvation, which is eternal life. Maybe you've never done that before. And today you want to become a Jesus follower. You know what? Today is your day. Why don't you repeat this prayer with me? Say it out loud. I pray to you, Lord Jesus, today I put my trust in you. You're my Lord, you're my Savior, and I trust that the life that you lived and the death that you died was enough for me, was enough for my salvation. I turn to you in faith, believing that you are for me and you're not against me. I am forever yours and you are forever mine. Thank you for this free gift of eternal life. It's in your holy name, Jesus, that I pray. Amen. I want you to know that if you said that prayer and you have put your trust in the saving work of Jesus, that all of heaven is celebrating you today and we celebrate with you. Let us know if this is the first time that you have entered into saving faith with him. Let us know what's going on in your life. We would love to put a book in the mail to encourage you and to help equip you and to, to really build this foundation of who you are in Christ Jesus. This is just the beginning of knowing his saving grace. It's been a great day with you. Thanks for tuning in. If you need prayer for anything, spiritual, financial, physical, emotional, would you comment here and let us know? We would love to be able to pray for you each and every week. Our staff prays over the prayer needs. We're standing with you in prayer today. If this service has made an impact in your life, we would ask you to partner with us. There's a couple ways that you can do that. Number one, share this video on whichever social platform that you're on. Share it and let other people know about this beautiful news of who Jesus is for us. And number two, consider partnering with us in your giving and help us continue spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ through this region and into the entire world. Once again, thank you for joining with us today. God bless you. As a church, it's our honor to play a small part in what God's doing in and through your life. And we would love to continue with you on that journey. To find out what your next steps could be in your relationship with Christ, all you have to do is go to Christchurch.la slash next. Here at Christ Church, our mission is to see people connected, restored, and empowered through the love of Jesus Christ. And that statement drives everything that we do as a church. All because we know and we believe whoever finds God finds life.